this discussion is on prejudice, the roots of prejudice. Let me introduce you to the four participants. From Iceland is Bjorn. Bjorn, who always has something new up his sleeve and who told us last night that in Iceland you can fish for boiled trout. How do you do that, Bjorn? Oh, yes, there is, on one place on the north coast of Iceland, there is a cold brook, and there is a trout in the brook, and there is an airpy hot spring, and the water from the hot spring flows to the brook, and it floats on the surface on the cold water. And if you catch the trout, you can pull him up to the hot upper layer and let him stay there for four or five minutes, and then, will, yeah, then you will get full trout. <laughs> but I, I cannot... Uh, that this is a story which we usually tell American tourists. <laughs> oh, so we won't tell you too seriously. From Malaya is Lehup Swan, a Chinese girl, who will be 18 tomorrow. From the Philippines is Patsy Pagaduan, who is the baby of the group, 15 years old. But uh, close runner-up is Saraj Chawanaviraj from Thailand, who is really only 15 too. Now, roots of prejudice. We started this discussion, I guess, on the train going out to St. Louis when Saraj from Thailand happened to mention that when Thai people talk about Westerners, they never refer to us as he or she, but only as it. And suddenly we began to see how Thai children, from practically the moment they start to talk, get a prejudice that Westerners aren't really quite human, aren't quite men or women, or, or sort of neuter. Uh, tell us more about that, Saraj, will you? I don't know why we do like that. Even if we like foreigner, we wouldn't say he or she is nice. We would say it is nice. <laughs> I've called them like this since my childhood. And, but after I came here and wanted to write a letter home to tell about my host students and the friends here, I thought there was no reason to call them like this, it. So I, I wrote he or she instead of it. And, but I wonder what my parents and my friends will think because uh, it doesn't sound familiar to Thai people at all. Uh, do you know the color the water becomes when we wash rice in it? Yes, uh, kind of muddy white. Uh, yes. Uh, if one of our people uh, behave in a Western way, we'll insult him by say, asking him, do you want to be the man with the rice water eyes? <laughs> <laughs> in Chinese, we do not refer to Westerners as white men. We call them red foreign devils. <laughs> <laughs> why, why do you call us such interesting names? Well, you aren't really white, you know, you're more pink. And I think that uh, in the beginning, when we saw people with light or uh, reddish hair, it was strange to us, because they do not have normal hair, which should be black. And, so, and we, we also refer to English monkeys. So. <laughs> but tell me, Sue, are, are Asian, Asian prejudice mainly against white people like me? Oh, no. <laughs> you see, it seems to me that Malaya is a land filled with more prejudices than anywhere else in the world. The Chinese do not like the Malays, because they do not eat pork which is the favorite <laughs> food of the Chinese. And one spiteful story suggests that the Malays were descended from the pigs, and that is why they don't eat them. And we have prejudices against the Japanese, of course. And many Malayans are anti-British, and we are very suspicious of the Siamese, <laughs> because we say that they use uh, black magic, and also because they did not fight against the Japanese. Well, it's true that the Japanese occupied our country in the Second World War, but they did not destroy it. Um, our country had been invaded by, had been destroyed by invaders so many times before. At first, uh, everyone thought that Japanese might win, mm. but, but after that we changed oh. our mind. Oh. <laughs> because we saw that Japanese would be, defeat, be defeated. But that was because our love to our country only. And, uh, but after that, there was an English expression to, uh, Siamese talk, <laughs> to call the best person who change easily. Oh, we are very ashamed of it. Please don't use it anymore. <laughs> I understand why you are prejudiced against Thailand. You know we have some prejudice against the Chinese, too. Oh, do you? What are they? Uh, there are so many Chinese in my country, and they run nearly all the business, and they are very, very, no very noisy, too. Mm. <laughs> oh. And when we get on a bus, and there is only a small space left, the Chinese will rush in and take it. And if we uh, uh, get up, to give the place to, to a little children or an old man. The Chinese will rush in and take it too. And if I sit between the two Chinese and they know each other, they start talking with our Korean people in the middle. 
and sprinkle so much saliva that I have to stand up. <laughs> That's not fair, Saroj. You're referring only to the uneducated class, and I think you're generalizing too much. Well, uh, the situation is quite similar in the Philippines. There are too many Chinese around, and they control almost all the business and trade. That's uh, why Filipinos have sort of some despise for them. That's not fair. How can you despise them just because they are, well, intelligent and initiative? Oh. <laughs> I don't think that would be fair either. That would be generalizing too much. <laughs> well, uh, we even have a popular rhyme which runs like this, in Chikbeho to Lulawai, and no, it means that Chinaman ruling Chinaman, and no Filipino would be glad to be called a Chinese. Well, we wouldn't want a <laughs> Filipino to be called a Chinese. <laughs> but I think uh, Filipino prejudice against Chinese dates back to the time of the Spaniards, when they were allowed to live only in the swamp area outside the walls of Manila. They had to pay higher taxes, and they had to go on forced labor for a longer time. Excuse me, Patsy, but in, in my country we have a, a quite different... Uh, opinion of the of the Chinese. We always think of the Chinese as very wise wise people with the men with long white beard. <laughs> well, I think it's because that uh, it's because you really didn't have uh, Chinese in your country yes, that you really, really didn't have uh, close contact with them. That's why you have that impression. <laughs> Perhaps you had close contact only with the, well, the poor people, the no, uneducated no, ones? No, no, no. no. The low no. class? No, no, no. The <laughs> average, I should say. Yeah. I'm not noisy, the am I? The exception. <laughs> <laughs> well, bubble, bubble. Do you have any prejudices? We've given Lehop Swan kind of a bad time here now. She seems to be taking it in her quiet way, may I say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, do you have any prejudices against other nationalities in the Philippines? Well, we have some prejudices against some people from India, too. Well, uh, in the Philippines, parents usually tell children awful stories about the Sikhs. By the way, they are those tall people from India who have, who have long beards and wear turbans. Uh, and, uh, well, they usually say that these Sikhs catch children and put them in the sacks they always carry. I was always told this by my mother to frighten me into obedience when I refused to eat my vegetables, and, they use, and it usually works. Well, war brought bitter feelings against the Japanese. Even nowadays in the Philippines, if uh, a Japanese goes around unscorted in the sw uh, slum districts of Manila, those crowded places, he wouldn't get up, he wouldn't get out all. He wouldn't only be killed, but he would be torn into pieces. He would be mobbed and. That's how they hate the Japanese be because of the war. But uh, there's a Japanese delegate in the forum who's just so sweet that I just can't uh, keep a grudge against her. <laughs> I like her very much. She's one of my best friends. You know, I feel the same way as you do, but I don't think that uh, if a Japanese were to come to Malaya, sh he or she would be torn to pieces because we are, well, better civilized people. <laughs> <laughs> and although um, sometimes... I try to, to get rid of all my prejudices. Well, Somehow let's try you out, Swan. You said you had prejudices against the white men, excuse me, pink men, and also against the <laughs> Japanese. Now, suppose you had to choose whether you were going to marry a Japanese or a white oh. European. Which would you choose? Well, um, I don't think I would choose either. Well, but suppose <laughs> you had to. Uh, I think I'll remain a spinster oh. after all. <laughs> 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 On this subject of prejudice, I wonder how many of them really begin way back in the nursery, like you said yours did about the Sikhs. I think it is very true. The, the only people I have ever hated are the Turks. Uh, I, I used to pray from my early childhood, God save me from the Turks. <laughs> and uh, when I was disobedient, my mother used to tell me that the Turks would come and take me. And mm. as I was often disobedient, I lived in constant hysterical fear of the Turks. And I started hating this, this atrocious <laughs> savages. And yet I had never seen a Turk before I met Hunter. <laughs> I, I think this started uh, hundreds of years ago, uh, in the early days of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, then a pirate, a pirate from Turkey or from Algeria used to sail to the northern countries and plunder the churches and steal healthy people from, for slaves. And uh, since then, the word Turk has the meaning of, all w of something which is aggressive and, and warlike. You know, since we've got a Turk right here in the studio, I think we probably ought to produce him 
and you can't produce a turkey in 1958 without a Greek. So I'm wondering, Patsy, would you and Swan cede your places to Onderguler from Turkey? And where's Onder? Here comes Onder. He's the one who was playing the mandolin at the opening of the program. That, by the way, is the Forum Blues that Onder composed shortly after he got here, and it's become almost our theme song. Everybody knows it. From Greece is Angeliki Layu. Now, uh, go ahead, aggressive and warlike Turk. Did you uh, <laughs> follow fully what Bjorn said about Turks? Yeah, I was listening to him, and, you know, we Turkish people would like very much for the other nations to see the difference between the Ottoman Empire and the modern Turkey today. Now, unfortunately, the people who don't know enough about <laughs> the things that happened in the 20th century always mixed up their prejudices about the Ottoman Empire with their thoughts about modern Turkey. I just wonder if you do the same thing in Greece, Aiki. Well, I just wouldn't say that we do the same thing in the same way in Greece. But it's interesting that one ocean and one continent across from Iceland, we still have kind of the same feeling towards the Turkish people. And I would say that it's kind of more natural for us because we really have suffered much during the 400 years of uh, the Turkish occupation. And because we had to survive, our nationalism and our difference from the Turks, which had to, uh, came to be uh, that we were better than the Turks, <laughs> <laughs> had to be stressed. And even today, if we see someone who doesn't eat in a very polite way, we usually say, are you a Turk? And it works. <laughs> and at school, when we study history, uh, we usually say that the Turks have destroyed a great civilization, our civilization. And what is interesting is that some people get the idea that Really, they didn't have any civilization, any great civilization of their own. And that, well, they're not very well educated. And generally, that no Turk can be any good. Also, another strong prejudice in my country is that uh, the assurance that some people have that the Greek people, now and forever, is one of the most important and intelligent peoples on Earth. <laughs> it sounds pretty interesting, yes, you know. <laughs> um, <coughs> I'm glad that the word Turk has a better meaning in here in the United States than it seems to have in Greece and Iceland. Am I not right that the members of the Young Turk group in Congress are glad and proud to be called Turks? Yes. Uh, anyway, uh, we got bigger problems with bigger nations, so we don't hear the same kind of prejudice in our country against Greece. Uh, you know, when I was a little boy, I used to play Russians and Turks just the same way <laughs> making kids play cowboys and Indians. <laughs> this shows that our biggest, biggest problem is with the people who are the biggest problem of the whole free world today. Um, you are also telling that um, we, s we spoiled your civilization in Greece by occupying your mm -hmm. country for more than 400 years. But I would like to point out that if the Ottoman Empire didn't give you the freedom of religion and the freedom of keeping your civilization, uh, I don't think you would be able to talk this, this, that way today just because there wouldn't be any nation co called Greece anymore, Greek nation anymore. Well, honestly, Andre, I don't think this is a very effective argument. First of all, I think that, of course, in different countries we study history in a different way and we stress different points. But still, I think that both of us would admit that maybe in the beginning uh, they did give a certain amount of religious freedom to the Greeks. Maybe just because they wanted, them to, they wanted to stress the Orthodox religion and keep them away from uniting in some way with the Catholics, which pr would produce a different situation for Turkey. But then I would say that later on, there were some really bad conditions for the Greeks. And they didn't have the opportunity to study their own language. They had to study it secretly under uh, bad conditions. And, well, I wouldn't say it was much of a tolerant spirit. But still, um, I don't think that a nation with the long tradition that the Greeks had, with a strong national conscience, with the, the language, with their r religion, and, uh, which was very different from the Turkish. And uh, by the way, I think that you would admit that the Turkish civilization wasn't as, Greek, as great as the Greek at that time. <laughs> I don't speak about today, I speak about that time. Uh, well, I think it would sur survive if even after, uh, under strong oppression, just because Oppression can't limit the mind of people uh, who have such a, a long tradition and who have to fight continuously as the Greeks had to fight. And I would say that after strong oppression, the nationalistic spirit just blossoms 
like the Greek, the Jewish, or anything else in the world. But tell me, you peaceful people, <laughs> <laughs> what about your feelings about the Cyprus dispute? Well, I would like to listen to the Greek point of view first. <laughs> the Greek or mine? Well, uh, uh, I thought that uh, your point of view was the same with the Greek point of view when I first, you, first met you in the beginning of the forum. Is there any difference now? Well, there's difference in all of my opinions and ideas oh. uh, in, in six weeks. Really, anyway. Ike? Yes, certainly. And I think this is one of the most important things that uh, this forum has done to us, to most of us. Well, go on. Forgive me for interrupting. <laughs> uh, well, I would say that our strongest ar argument, the stro strongest argument of the people of Cyprus, is that every human being has the right to... Um, so the, self, the right of self-determination. And uh, I would say that, of course, the situation now in Cyprus is very difficult because of the uh, strong conflict between the Greeks and the Turks. But uh, as some British people admit, and as we point out in Greece, I don't know what you say in Turkey, uh, this problem really didn't exist uh, some years ago. But it began to exist just because the British aroused it so that they could divide and rule. And... Um, I would say that now that Great Britain hasn't, uh, doesn't have hold of the situation anymore. But um, I would say that Cyprus really was a part of Greece for many, many years, uh, more than it was a part of Turkey. And of course, your argument that it's near Turkey is very strong. Well, let's but hear Anders' argument. Strongest. Well, uh, you see that self-determination is the uh, most important thing for a place to be belonging to some other mm -hmm. country. But uh, we must also uh, take consideration of the uh, historical and geographical facts. Mm -hmm. As you know, Turkish, uh, um, Cyprus has been under Turkish rule for more than 300 years. Mm -hmm. And um, it's only 43 miles away from uh, Turkey and it's 150 miles away from Greece. You know, the Taurus Mountains, which are on the southern part of Turkey, just go under the sea and go up again, mm -hmm. the, they fix the Cyprus. I mean, this is a part of Turkey. Mm -hmm. but and, uh, of course, I um, realize that there are more Greek people in Cyprus than Perfect. Turkish people. There are, I think, uh, 300,000 Greek people and 120,000 Turkish people. And um, our opinion about Cyprus is not to have the whole part of the island. We wouldn't be so foolish to want that. I mean, it, there are so many people in Turkey who want it th that way, but I just don't think that way because it's not the logical way. But I think that the northern part of the island, where there are more Turks, must be belonging to Turkey. So uh, we will be sure of that uh, the rights of the Turks, Turkish people over there are given, uh, as well as the rights of the Greek mm -hmm. people there. And uh, I mean, if we have that part of island, uh, we won't have so many things. I mean, there will be just a few more grapes and wine in Turkey and this is all. But we will be spending much money to defend that part of the island against uh, the other nations who don't want the real peace over the world. You could realize how bad it would be if Russia had a base in Cyprus and control all the Europe. And as you realize, Turkey has a strong army. And uh, if uh, Greece has uh, Cyprus, Turkish, uh, Turkey will be defending that part of the world against Russia indirectly because of NATO. But if we have it, and we'll be defending this part of the world against Russia very well. Don't you think that NATO is able to defend Cyprus? Well, if we'll be in Cyprus, then we'll be able to defend it by ourselves and by NATO. Now it's by the British. May I speak, please? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, I don't see why we wouldn't be able to defend Cyprus, as we are able to defend Greece, and we were able to defend it, even after the uh, great... After, after the disaster that had come after the Second World War, I won't go very far into that. But okay. I would say that the, uh, his, your historical argument is not too strong because Greece, first of all, uh, was under Turkish uh, occupation for 400 years. And I still think that Turkey does recognize Greece as a nation now as, and as a country now. <laughs> and uh, as for the it's geographical, weird. it's strong. But look at Pakistan. It's divided by India. Still, it's, it's one country, one nation. And, um, well, I don't think that many people in the island would really like the partition of the island. But, and I don't, I don't think that Greece would like for the island uh, what I would like for it. Well, my point is that for some years, uh, Cyprus could be sort of independent nation under the control uh, of NATO. 
uh, just so that it's the, the atmosphere is a little calm. And after that, we could have self-determination. And I think that the rights of the minority could be very much respected, as they are in the northern part of Greece, while they are not in Turkey. Well, uh... But don't you think now, Angelique, if, if uh, Cyprus would be unified with Greece now, that 19.4% uh, 19 19 of the Turkish minority would uh, suffer from the, from the Greek rule? Honestly, I don't because, think so. Mm -hmm. I think that the, they wouldn't like it, and I think that it might start even a war. That's why I don't, I don't really uh, think that Cyprus should unite with Greece. But still, I think that we do respect the rights of the Turkish minority in the north. But what about Cyprus being a commonwealth of Britain, like, like the... I don't think the people of Cyprus There'll be like still that. troubles in Cyprus, you know, if uh, Great Britain will be on uh, mm -hmm, Cyprus, yes. because, uh, uh, you know, all the uh, fights and everything in Cyprus are because of the... Uh, just because the Great Britain does not give the same rights to, the, to every individual in the island, and that makes the problem. And as we are in the NATO with Greece, and I think it would be the best way to divide the island in two parts. I, I don't want the whole part of the island, but just a part of it. And because uh, of the some because of the facts that I pointed that out, you you told me that uh, there had been a change between your uh, op opinion about Cyprus before you came here and uh, n now. Um, would you please explain that to us? I mean, what difference did you feel? Uh, you had by being here in the United States just about two months? Well, uh, when I refer to the difference, I would I'd rather refer to the difference uh, between my prejudices against Turks, which weren't very strong when I came here, but they're less stronger now, <laughs> much okay. less stronger. Still, uh, I think I've understood much better and uh, that really it's not a solution to, uh, for Cyprus to unite with Greece right now. I mean, I had a vague idea, but I wasn't that sure. I've got to interrupt you. We've only oh. got a few mon minutes more, and we've been talking so much about prejudices about each other's countries. I wonder if each of you could quickly, starting with you, Bjorn, tell us whether you have some prejudices against Americans because of Americans in your country. Yes, I, I think that it's not really against Americans, it's only against the American TIs who, who remain in the country. You say there is a, I would say, segregation. The American, they have, they have a town of their own in Keflavik, their air base. And uh, every Saturday there comes a group of Americans to our capital town. Well, who segregates who? Uh, I don't, there is a... Uh, I think we, we dislike the Americans. It is, uh, it is because of the, in the war time, it is strange to say, but... Uh, in the war time when the, when the American took over the defense of Iceland, uh, we asked, in the Icelandic government asked for, as I have been told, for uh, troops who, have, who were under good discipline. But in the translation from America, from English, from Icelandic to English, it, uh, it was uh, mistranslated. Instead of, of selected troops, they, they said picked troops. And you sent the Marines. And it was uh, not the best troops you could get. Let's go on quickly to Greece. Oh. Well, I think we have the same problem as in Iceland because the spirit of the community, which in some ways is uh, a strong uh, element of Americans in America, is not quite good abroad because they form a clique. And we certainly don't like that. And then, oh, the, the, the tourists who come and look at Parthenon and the old monuments and the museums and they just pass around the old beautiful uh, pieces of sculpture and architecture and make such sometimes silly uh, remarks on them. And then I've heard the question asked, what on earth do you do with this money we give you? Why don't you reconstruct those old ruins there? <laughs> and those old ruins, as you know, are our pride. I would like to add that, that uh, in, and often when American troops come to, to, uh, to our Icelandic towns and they call, uh, na call us natives, we are very, very angry because we consider us uh, to have at least 700 years older culture than Americans have. They feel very superior. Let's get a comment from Monday. Well, I don't think the American service personnel in Turkey are representing their countries in the right way. You know, when those GIs away from their country, they think that they are able to do many things, and they even think that they are uh, free to do some of the things that which you can't, 
which they can even do here in the United States. So that gives a bad impression about the American people in Turkey. But anyway, Turkish people like Americans and we like the government and policy. I just wonder, uh, all three of you have mentioned the segregation of the Americans. It's been called golden ghettos. It makes me wonder whether the strength of America at home, which is the community feeling, the wanting to be together and cooperate with your neighbor, doesn't work against us abroad. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. yes it it works for us in this country, but when we carry it, ab carry it abroad, you, you feel mm -hmm. we're segregated, really. Mm -hmm. well, let's get a reaction quickly from but, uh, Thailand. I'm sorry, our time's almost up. What about a uh, reaction to Americans in Thailand? Well, I don't think the people in Thailand like the Americans so much. First, because of the, I G the GI, too. There are so many GI in my country. And always drunken, and they try something, and... <laughs> but what about the aid, the American yes. aid? The other thing, uh, we, most of the people in Thailand think that we are under America secretly. That may be because of the, uh, the American aids to our country. We, I think there are so many aids to our country, such as uh, uh, education, arms, military, advisory in military, agriculture, etc. So we just wonder, yeah, why are we have so much like that? In what state are we connected? So we just have a thought and begin to think like I've told you. I'm sorry, that's all the time we've got. You just have a thought and begin to think like you've told us. Uh, next week at this time, we'll be talking again about other routes 